Sorry, I thought I was unmuted. Well, welcome everybody. This is our first talk of the 2022 Salon season. And I'm so happy to have you all with us. I'm Lisa Fox Martin, the chair of the Board of Trustees, all of whom join me in thanking you for joining us today, which promises to be a fascinating talk. So I will now turn you over to Betsy Jacks, our executive director, who will introduce the speakers this afternoon. And again, thank you so much for joining us and enjoy the talk. Bye. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Lisa. And I'd like to thank MassMoca for being the most enjoyable and collegial partners on this project. Today, we get a sneak peek at Mark Swanson's studio, where he is making artworks for his solo show that will open at MassMoca on March 12th and the companion exhibition that will open here at the Thomas Cole site in July. Mark's studio is just down the hill from here in the Thomas Cole land of Catskill, New York. And it's no coincidence because his work is really very closely tied to Thomas Cole's. And pulling all the threads together, this season we will have an exhibition of Thomas Cole's paintings that is curated by Frank Kelly at the National Gallery of Art. And the show then will take a deep look at Cole's last works. So today, after our conversation with Mark, there'll be a brief question and answer session. So during this program, as you think of questions, just go down to the Q&A button and type them in at any time. So now I will pass it over to Kate Mencaneri, our wonderful chief curator and director of curatorial affairs, contemporary art and fellowship at the Thomas Cole site. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you, Lisa. Um, thanks to everybody who's here with us on Zoom today. I'm so excited. Um, before I begin, I would just like to acknowledge with gratitude that the Thomas Cole site is located on the ancestral lands of the Mohegan, Mohawk, Haudenosaunee, and other Algonquin-speaking Indigenous peoples. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors, past and present, as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. We respect the enduring relationships that exist between these peoples and the land and waterways. So thank you all again for being here. I am excited to welcome two people who I admire beyond words, Denise Marconish and Mark Swanson. Denise is the senior curator and director of exhibitions at Mass MoCA. And I just long admired her exhibitions, the way she works with artists, her writing is incredible. Um, and you've probably seen her exhibitions, but um, she's done projects with Nick Cave, Teresita Fernandez, um, Explode Every Day, an inquiry into the phenomena of wonder and Badlands, New Horizons in Landscape. Mark Swanson is an artist who has exhibited nationally and internationally. He has work in collections at the Smithsonian, the Whitney Museum, the Brooklyn Museum of Art. And as Betsy mentioned, um, we're so fortunate that he has studios in Catskill. Um, and so it's been such a treat to be able to be in conversation with him. Today, we will get a sneak peek into the studio behind the scenes and have a conversation in anticipation of our collaborative exhibitions. And I'm really excited for this and grateful for the opportunity to work with Mark and Denise and with Massimoka. Um, Mark's exhibition at the Cole site is part of our ongoing series, Open House, Contemporary Art in Conversation with Cole. And this is a series uh, where we invite contemporary artists to create site-specific exhibitions and installations within the 19th century historic interiors and across the historic home of the artists and studios of Thomas Cole. And projects um, have ranged from those that literally reference Cole's work to those that expand upon in our present moment um, concerns and issues that he wrestled with, such as landscape, environmental preservation, art, history, the sublime. And it's been just such a dynamic and exciting program. Um, and at the heart of it is kind of this idea that all art is contemporary. And um, it really means a lot for us to be able to collaborate with contemporary artists working today. 
at this historic site. So without further ado, I would like to hand it over to Denise and to Mark to talk a little more about this exhibition that is coming up this year. Denise, you wanna take Thanks. it away? Yeah, thanks so much, Kate. Um, I, I also have to say it's been an absolute delight to be working with the Thomas Cole National Historic Site on this project. And, um, <clears throat> you know, the I think we're both really engaged with how contemporary artists are thinking today, particularly around ideas of landscape conservation and, and really just supporting artists. You know, I, I found a great partner institution in you guys in, in the way that we both like to provide opportunities for artists to sort of think outside of the box, to engage with the issues of our time, to engage with art history and, and to dream. And so it's been really wonderful um, to work with you guys and, and you, of course, Mark. So I'm gonna start with a little bit of background. Um, I first met Mark, had known his work for many, many years. And we finally met in person around 2005 when I was um, living in New Haven. And I still remember you had this gigantic studio in Brooklyn. Um, and we just sat there and I always say some of the best studio visits are the ones where you hardly even look at the work and you just realize you're connecting with each other. And I, you know, I remember us talking about Elliot Smith and, um, you know, artists that we admired and, and, you know, it was just one of those click moments where you knew that someday we were going to work together. And I, and I probably even left the studio visit saying, someday we're going to work together. <laughs> Um, and then a few years later, um, both Mark and I uh, uprooted from our various city lives and came out to the country, uh, Mark moving to Catskill and me coming to North Adams. And it was an amazing opportunity for us to reconnect. Um, and I remember going out to your studio and seeing the show you did at the Basilica in Hudson in 2016. Um, and us saying, um, we're never going to let this much time pass again before we <laughs> reconnect. And uh, I was digging through my emails, trying to like piece together this history. And I found the email after I came to the Basilica and I said, we, now we really have to find that time to do something together. So I remember, Mark, you came out here shortly after. And we started to look at the spaces at Mass Mocha. And um, for people on this call who may not have been here, uh, you know, Mass Mocha is an old uh, mill building. We have about 300,000 square feet of exhibition space. So whenever I bring artists to look at spaces, a healthy dose of fear is um, a good way to start. <laughs> and I showed Mark um, a large space on the top of our, our second floor, about 10,000 square feet of exhibition space and said, what would you like to do here? <laughs> and you know, his eyes got big and, and we just started that process. And you know, one of the things that Mass Mocha loves to do is start with artists from, from nothing, start from just pure concept and work towards uh, fabricating things. I have to say, it's been so wonderful that Mark is only an hour and a half drive away and the same with the coal site because we could build things and we could just drop it off at the studio and then I could get to the studio when Mark had a question and Mark, Kate and I could get together and walk through the, uh, the historic home of Thomas Cole. And I think without that proximity and that us, us all being embedded in this region, this show would have ended up being something entirely different. So it, it really is born out of this collaboration and, and this place. So um, that's a, a good amount of back, uh, backstory to start. And um, I'll also note that I remember Kate coming, uh, reaching out to me to bring the, the Cole Fellows to Mass Mocha for a tour, but also just for us as two curators in the region to pick each other's brains about contemporary art and working with artists. And, um, and so when Mark started talking about Thomas Cole being a, an inspiration for this show, it, it was a sort of natural connection. Um, but before I talk, turn it over to Kate and Mark to talk a little bit about Thomas Cole, Mark, I, I was wondering if you would maybe um, enlighten us a little bit on some of the themes you've been thinking about around this show and in particular, um, 
one of my favorite exhibition titles I think that has ever existed, A Memorial to Ice at the Dead Deer Disco. So I wonder if you could take, take it from there and talk a little bit about what you've been thinking about for this exhibition. Sure, sure. Um, well, I should start by saying I'm so grateful and thankful um, to be working with both Mass Milka and Thomas Cole. It's a, literally a dream come true for an artist to be doing, um, or this artist to be doing anything in either spaces. But just like you said, how we've, we've all been able to collaborate and work together and sort of be here together has just been amazing. And I will also say that Yes, when Denise took me to that space, my eyes got really big and I teared up because it was just like probably out of terror and excitement too. And just sort of having that opportunity and just, <clears throat> you know, Mass Mocha uh, has just been incredible with their support and um, Denise's support and just, and I will say too that I'm very excited. This is the first time I think this has ever happened that when Denise asked me to do the show. We had the first visit. I said, so what are you thinking? What would you, what were we thinking I should do for this show? And um, Denise said one of the best answers I've ever heard from a kid. She said, I want you to do whatever you want. And um, for me, I don't try to tell the artists what to do because I'm really interested in hearing what they're going to dream up. And to hear that as an artist, it's a little scary, I have to say, in some ways, um, but then also just amazing. So um <clears throat> so just to extend the thanks and gratitude all around but yeah the memorial to ice of the dead deer just go it's so funny that um that title i was really kind of afraid to use it i had i had two titles i had in mind the memorial to ice and the dead deer disco and then i thought well maybe i could just make that the whole title and that sort of came about um i did a residency through the catskill center at the Platte Clove uh, cabin. And I had a feeling we'd be talking about this. I have a picture of it here, um, which is this amazing little, beautiful, exactly what you think of, like the perfect little cabin. It's right above a waterfall in Platte Clove. And um, Platte Clove is so beautiful and it's this amazing spot. And I went there for a week-long residency in September. It was cold and I was kind of by myself that time of year, especially that many years ago um there was no one else around and the there's no running water and it's wood and so there's like an outhouse that heated with wood you have to bring the wood in there's um you have to sort of figure out how you're going to bathe how you're going to shower you know all this stuff and they people suggest to bring a solar uh shower thing which is where you fill you fill it with river water and let it warm up in the sun but in at the end of september that doesn't work out so well so in the morning every morning i would go down with these big um sort of like uh lobster pot kind of steam things and i would fill one up um and bring it back and boil it for water to bathe in and then i would come back and do it again and bring it back from the the creek below and the waterfall below to get water to cook with and to clean up with and all this stuff. And so to boil in the water, to make it safe. And through the week there, it was sort of, it became this very sort of like meditative thing, like, okay, you know, how do I get the wood stove stock to be warm throughout the night? How do I start it in the morning? How do I bathe? How do I eat? And the elements are so close when you're, when you're living like that. And then I spent, most of my time I intended to make artwork there, but I spent most of my time just hiking. So I would hike about two or three hours in the morning and then three or four hours in the afternoon, go back for lunch usually. And sometimes I would take my lunch and stay out all day. And I hiked in the rain. I hiked when it was cold. I hiked when it was warm. And it was like, I would bring all these layers and everything. And it was this amazing experience of being, I think it was sort of having to think about how to like just live in these very elemental ways um, that I, I realized I started feeling incredibly present and connected to what was there. And I started shooting these very close up videos, mostly of like really tiny moments of like a leaf kind of blowing around in a puddle or, you know, a drip happening um, into the waterfall um, and sort of zeroing in on this. But the, the, 
it would have this this kind of action of really focusing in also sort of like made the big picture very clear and i felt like i was really kind of at one with the universe there in this really special and very like spiritual way i have to say and then this thing happened um where it was like i would be having this thing just so in the moment so in the present nothing from the outside world coming in and then it would hit me that this may not last it was that climate change would change all of this and how long would it be there and how long could we take this for granted and how long would these trees be standing how long you know would this be flooded out all these things and so i was immediate i was instantly catapulted into the future and felt guilty and sort of all these things at once and like was a really complicated um emotion emotional connection to like just wanting to be there wanting to be at one with it but sort of just being forced to kind of think about this doom that was coming and i had this moment probably i can't remember when it was but i had this moment of realizing that 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 feeling felt very similar to when i was 17 and moved to the city and started going to nightclubs to gay clubs and and queer nightclubs for the first time and feeling so connected so, so like i had found this home so at one with the universe it felt so right but then with the specter of aids there was always a kind of doom there too and so i realized that these two things had a very that these two places that i felt the most spiritually connected and the most sort of uh at, like at one with what was happening and the most comfortable all both of them had this kind of thing where i was catapulted into this like doom of like what might happen um and then death <laughs> so so like i said then it was kind of like a choice between so i wanted to do a sort of a memorial talk about a disco kind of conflate these two things which felt very difficult to try and do at the time and so i had the two titles of memorial to ice as a memorial literally to the, you know melting um glaciers and and ice caps and everything else and the dead deer disco talking about the the specter of aids and so i just put them together and i've done that in the work too i hope we'll see you have you have for sure <laughs> um and so the other thing that i i remember when we first connected with kate at the cole site is um she sent us some of cole's writings and i remember you coming back after reading those um and then also realizing that you had these very personal connections to Cole. So I wonder if you and Kate can talk a little bit about um, how Thomas Cole has like influenced uh, this show um, as well. Yeah, absolutely. Am I back on? I'm unmuted. Hi, Mark. Well, um, I'll flash to, I'm going to open my, uh, just show a slide. Let me see if I can share my PowerPoint. <clears throat> Um, here we go. And let me go to slideshow. Is it on? Play from start. All right. Can everyone see? So, um, Here's a picture. This is Mark. When was this in 2019? Um, I like Denise said, I think Mark, I don't remember if we first met at like the Bard MFA show or at your exhibition at the Geary Center. Um, but we were in conversation and when we were working on a project in 2019 with the artist She Gori, who was going around retracing all of the locations that Thomas Cole had painted. Um, he had discovered this, you know, this particular painting here on Catskill Creek and had located this rock that just so happened to be on the property where Mark lives. And Mark and I were talking about it and Mark was like, oh, please, you know, come and visit. And it was so generous and wonderful. We walked the property together and literally lined up this painting um, with what it looks like now. And Guari set up a giant, I think it must have been, you know, a 10 foot long um, camera obscura on Mark's property um, to re-photograph this as part of his 
exhibition absence presence at the Thomas Cole site. Um, but we really started talking at that point, Mark, and I think um, I'm really interested in, you know, how you became interested in Thomas Cole and um, the connections for me are, are just, there's so many connections um, and I've been so excited about this, but, you know, from Cole's melancholy um, to Cole's really active advocacy um, advocating for balance between the built and natural world. And so in his writing that we've shared with Mark and Denise um, in his paintings, he's really talking about, um, you know, we interpret him as a proto-environmentalist because he is advocating for balance between the built and natural world. And so Mark, do you wanna talk a little bit about that? I also wanna tell you, I'm so excited. I was revisiting Cole's journal and um, not only are these, you know, these incredible quotes I could read to you um, about, you know, advocating for preservation. But in his journal, Mark, I'm gonna send this to you. He's also talking about, um, I found this one date in his journal in March where he had gone up to Catterskill Falls and he talks about gigantic towers of ice that are as silent as death and that they look like chandeliers or pendants in a Gothic cathedral. And he's describing these 30 foot, icicles. Um, and I have to send it to you, but there's really so many different connections um, that, you know, it's, I'm really excited to spend this year working on it with you all. Yes, please do send that. That's really exciting. And that, um, those icicles, literally the icicles at Catterskill Falls, I have images of them in the show and they were a huge inspiration for um, work that I started working on for the Basilica, the show at the Basilica that Denise saw. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's so exciting. And the, speaking of Thomas Cole's journals, I found out that there, before we started working together, I found out that Thomas Cole's journals were in the New York State Library. And I called them and said, you know, is it possible to see um, facsimiles of the, um, the, the uh, journals? And they said, oh no, you can just come see them. And I was like, what? <laughs> and they were like, yeah, you can just come see them. You sit with somebody and you can look through it. And I couldn't believe I could look through the actual journals. I never did that because you guys sent me the, um, some, some uh, uh, you know, screen uh, scans of them. So I'm kind of relieved that I didn't actually have to handle them myself because I'd be so nervous. Um, but Kate, can you pull back up that picture from with Gwari? Um, I, uh, Yes, my partner and I, Joe, bought this house on the Catskill Creek and it, the house had been for sale for three and a half years and it was so overgrown and we didn't even go down to the creek um, when we saw the house. We just knew there was a creek and that it kind of separated property. We were thinking a creek, not like what a river, which is what they call creeks around here. And um, we, as after spending a lot of time down there, just a couple months really after we bought the house I came to a show at the Thomas Cole house and it was the first time I visited and what was the show called Kate it was Frederick Church was Thomas Cole's only student and it was a show about them together their works they did together yeah that was in 2014 it was a show we did with John Wilmer Dean um master mentor master uh and it was about the time that Frederick Church's work um that he made when he was studying with Thomas Cole 1846 to 44 to 46. Right. So this, we had, I had seen the show and there was drawings on that said the Catskill Creek and there was drawings side by side. So one of Thomas Cole and one of Frederick Church of the same imagery. And I turned to my partner, Joe, and I said, this looks like our backyard. And, um, and he said, it really does. And so I said to the docent, I said, I know this sounds crazy, but this really looks like our backyard could this be in Catskill, like right, you know, in this part? And she said, and the docent said, oh yeah, if you live over here by this Tatiana's restaurant and right there, that was Thomas Cole's favorite place to paint. And I, I like nearly fell over. And um, I was kind of stuck in my practice, like getting out of New York City um, and coming up here, it was a sort of a return to me. I grew up in New Hampshire and had lived in cities for almost 30 years. And so it was this kind of return. And it was, I was very discombobulated. I was leaving the New York art world and the pressures that come with that. 
and kind of confused on where I was. And so when I, doing a little more research, realized that Thomas Cole not only like liked to paint and painted mo the most paintings he ever did around this part of the creek, but then also doing some research, found out that he walked almost daily along the creek and literally walked on our property and down the street and on Snake Road where we used to walk, which is right down the street. Um, and I sort of was like, maybe there's something here. Maybe there's something with Thomas Cole for me to, to work on. And this sort of, the, I started researching the Hudson River Valley School painters in general and sort of their relationship to the city and how many of them had studios on 10th Street in the East Village. And then they were they had houses up here. And at the time it was a weekend house. We quickly moved up here full time, but it was sort of this like, and a lot of artists were starting to move up here at that time, like in little drips and drabs, but we were all talking to each other and all reconnecting kind of like me and Denise did. It would be these people who had really seen for years in New York City. And then we would see each other up here and be like, oh, you're here too. Oh, you're here too. And there started to be, to be this sort of talk of like a new Hudson River School, you know, with all the artists leaving um, the city and coming up here. And so I thought maybe there was something there with Thomas Cole and really started to research it. And then it's going to the Platteville residency again, you know, it's, it's there, the trails there are places that, that he went, you know, and it felt very close to Thomas Cole and what was going on. And Thomas Cole was so upset about the development and what was going on. And the trails I walked on at Platte Clove up to like Codfish Point, there's a lot of trailheads right there. Those were actually toll roads because there was so much industry in, in Catskill, in the Catskills at the time. And Thomas Cole was so upset about the development on the creek and all these things. And um, so I started thinking about that relationship and then Anyway, we can get more to that later, but just kind of, yeah, that this that this painting, you know, like I, I I'll pull it up on my phone too. Like this, you know, this rock. I don't know if you can see it, but in this painting, which is down here at the bottom, this this big rock right there is the rock that me and Gwari are looking at there. And on this side of the painting, where there's a a guy fishing on the rocks, like those are those rocks, like literally the rocks that go down to the water right that in front of the iPad that you're holding. So when I also just realized it, it was like the exact spot where he spent a lot of time painting and being, I just felt like there, I don't know, it's just sort of following my nose that maybe there was some sort of connection. So Mark, I remember when we met, you were talking about this revelation and, and that's when I was like, Hey, do you know Kate over at the Cole House? <laughs> um, and then I remember going back to Cole's 1841 essay um, on American scenery and, you know, particularly quotes like he says, I cannot but exp express my sorrows that the beauty of such landscapes are quickly passing away. The ravages of the axe are daily increasing and the most noble scenes are made desolate and often sometimes with a wantonness and barbarism scarcely credible in a civilized nation. And, you know, I remember us having this conversation just as you were starting to build the work and starting to think about what this memorial would look like. That, you know, that very interesting moment where Cole, if he were to come back today and look at this area, he would, at first feel a sense of relief until we told him the reality. And so I, I wonder if you can sort of talk a little bit about that shift in perspective and then how you use that to sort of start building the work that will be in both of these exhibitions. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. I mean, that was that I kept thinking about that and kind of obsessing about it because Thomas Cole's family and correct me if I'm wrong, Kate, if I get any of this historical stuff wrong with Thomas Cole and his family, but they they came here from England, basically outrunning the Industrial Revolution of England because they were decorative artists. And so they're, what they were doing was being sort of replaced by factory, you know, made goods. And so they were, they were kind of bouncing around in the U.S. Um, trying to outrun the, the Industrial Revolution here. And... Thomas Cole's father was literally a Luddite and like, you know, tried, was part of the protest to stop the industrial revolution. And so Thomas Cole had this like 
incredible sort of he had a view into what would happen that people didn't happen here in the US. You know, he saw the destruction happen. So when he saw it started happening here, he was just devastated because it was so in the short time that when he got here, when it was so like, you know, untouched relatively compared to like when, you know, he was writing what you're writing. Um, and the he was especially upset about the development along Catskill Creek. There was a grist mill right up, right, you know, at the at the front of this painting, there was a grist mill and the ravages of the ax. And yeah, I kept thinking about how we have so much protected land now, all the huge hotels, the railroads, the, the grist mills, the ice houses, the, you know, the tanneries, the quarries, it's all gone and it's all protected land. And it's just hundreds of thousands of acres, you know, that just the Catal Catskills and the Adirondacks alone is just, you know, mind boggling how much is protected. This whole, I have pictures, old pictures of the whole land and every land around my house, that was all clear cut. There was no trees. And so that, yeah, that idea that Thomas Cole would come back now and just see so many more trees. And at the time, trees being cut down were the big you know that was the big indication and and the railroads coming through and everything and that sort of fascinated me that idea that this is something that you know we're the first generation to be aware of what we're doing is destroying the planet you know in a certain way i mean he he was just sort of saying this is terrible what's happening but a lot of it was you know, American scenery, but he was an early ecologist and in line with the transcendentalists and about the spiritual connections to nature. And so that whole, the, the idea of a memorial, I think came, you know, through that idea that like, you know, if, if we tend to, as a culture, I think, celebrate things right when they're going away, you know, we memorialize things like, you know, I read a great essay about, you know, that the, the Crystal Palace in London, they put it up like right in the right, they, they cut down the forest to put it up and then inside, you know, used all this greenery and stuff. So you can look at the forest, you know, and the Victorians as everything was getting, um, as these animals were being hunted into extinction. And as we were developing things everywhere, the Victorians were bringing, you know, terrariums and aquariums and animal imagery into their homes and so we tend to kind of like memorialize things right away we tend to sort of celebrate them as soon as we lose them so i was sort of thinking what how would that how could i sort of propel us very shortly into the future and 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 do a memorial to sh to kind of bring us to this place where we'd already be missing it instead of this just living in fear of um you know, almost to like, not really like snap people's attention, everyone's aware, but put us in the, put us in that emotional space of sort of mourning and um, sort of thinking about where we are now too. And, and I'm like a real believer in the fact that like, I mean, if you, I, if you barely scratch the surface in any research in climate change, there is no good news. But I also feel like whenever I speak to anybody about it, it takes about 30 seconds for most people to just be like, I, you know, I, I just can't think about it. And, and I think in a way for me, I'm trying to bring in this sort of idea of how we deal with sort of the, the trauma and the monumentality and using art in a, in, and theatricality and a sort of distance to be able to look at this problem emotionally i think i would say maybe and and sort of spiritually instead of just kind of like what we have to stop doing what we have to feel sort of horrible about what we have to feel guilty about what the the solutions are because we get a lot of that information but i think it sort of shuts us down and i feel like opening it up into a larger conversation of what it means to us holistically as people um was important to me yeah i think it's interesting in, in the conversations we've had over the years at how frequently the term tenderness has come up. There's a kind of like beauty and melancholy, but in this kind of holding on to one another and realizing that in this, in these moments of, of mourning and memorial, there's also this great beauty and like that kind of 
you know, not to like use the goofy Ferris Bueller line, but like if you don't stop and pay attention to it, it's just going to pass you by. And I think with all of this information that happens around climate change, we get so um, bogged down in the data and the impossibility of it. You know, Timothy Morton talks about it as a hyper object, as this thing that is so big that we can't even grasp it. And I think what has been so amazing for me as you're building this show is how human it feels and how it, um, and, and that tenderness, like there's, you know, uh, there's a piece behind you of these two deer mounts just leaning against each other. And you get the sense that like, if it weren't for one another, they would fall over. They're holding each other up there. They're, you know, clinging. Um, and I think there's, you know, even though there's so many themes in this show that are um, dark, there's, there's, it's not hopeless, which I think is, is really amazing. Well, you know, it's funny you say that because there is, there's a piece in the show that's very, uh, very directly influenced by the Pieta. And when I visited Rome, um, I saw the Pieta in person, but the, Rome had this effect on me where I like longed for it and missed it like a person, you know, and still do. And I'm sort of like desperate to go back there. And I started thinking about it and looking at things in like the ruins of there, you know, there's 2000 year old like fountains that are still functioning in the square where you go and have like gelato at the end of the night, you know what I mean? And where people congregate. And I think there's this special thing that happens in a, in a place like Rome where the past is so present that you, I think it's why uh, Romans enjoy their life so much because like you're constantly reminded that this city has existed for thousands of years. And you, so you've got like what? A hundred at, at best, if you're lucky to sort of enjoy it. And I think this is, it is sort of a strategy I'm trying to employ here of like, how can we, I think we have to stay in this moment to sort of deal with this. But at the same time, you know, we keep being propelled into this into this ruin of the future where we can't even like think, you know what I mean? So it's like sort of like, how can we sort of like process this information so we can like stay here and, and you know, as Donna Haraway, stay with the trouble, you know, and kind of like, how do we process it, I guess, in a certain way. I'm gonna bring up a, a funny moment. For for a long time, Mark and I were talking uh, about this show and, and he had come up with this great term called future nostalgia. Um, and this notion of, of longing for a future you know you won't experience. And then of course the singer Dua Lipa came up with an album called Future Nostalgia. So that's all you get when you Google it now. But in many, so we started having these other conversations of like, how do we talk about this idea? and and in some ways, I, I like the, the sort of new conversation even better, which is like, what does it mean to live in the ruins of the future? This kind of perpetual, you're not in the present, you're not in the future, you're not in the past, you're in this really liminal space between all of them. And so I think that's mm -hmm. a, a really interesting idea that will permeate both shows and that when you dig back into Cole's thinking and writing is there, it's there so presently. And so it's really interesting how that kind of like, we, we fell in love with this one term and then couldn't use it. And we came back to something because as, as soon as you said the ruins of the future, of course, I thought of Cole's course of empire and, and things like that. And it just it almost seemed to just create a full circle moment even more. Yeah. Yeah, and then the future nostalgia, it's so, I, I was kind of obsessed with that idea of like, sort of like this weird knowledge that we know will be nostalgic for now, then. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I mean, I think we can always know we're gonna be nostalgic for the past, but like, there is this kind of thing that we, if things don't radically change, we know we'd be nostalgic for this time because things can exist in a way, you know? And I think, I think a lot of, you know, really great thinkers are thinking, some of the thinkers, of course, I adhere to or, or that art can really do it, but that also we have to sort of move to this adaptation model and not sort of like how to stop the increase in temperature from having, which I think is in line with what I'm talking about. Like, how do we live in this acceptance that it's here 
and not just be in this doom of the future. Because as with the AIDS crisis, like we couldn't, you know, we, I didn't know. I didn't know, you know, what, what it was going to be like. And, and it, it, there was no way out of it. You know what I mean? But I had to live, you know, and I had to be intimate with people. And so what was, how do you deal with it? Do you know what I mean? You live with it instead of sort of in fear of it, I think, in a certain way. And, and that really is what grief is. It's not moving past something, but it's learning to live with it. I, I, I keep thinking about like, well, what, when we broke, if Cole were here again and we broke the news to him about what was happening to the planet, like what would his reaction be? I think he, I mean, he, I think he expected it, you know, I mean, like with works like Lament of the Forest, our doom is near, behold, from east to west, the skies are darkened by ascending smoke, each hill and every valley, it's become an altar unto mammon and the gods of man's idolatry. The victims we, Missouri's floods are ruffled as by storm and Hudson's rugged hills at midnight glow by light of man's projected meteors. We feed 10,000 fires in our short day. The woodland's growth of centuries is consumed. And he goes on, this is a piece he wrote, Lament of the Forest, 1838. And he ends with a few short years, our ancient race shall be like Israel scattered among the tribes of men. Like, I don't, I don't know if Cole thought we would still be here, um, but it's it's a good question. And, and I think, and the grief, and it's just, I think Cole would absolutely love this this show and all of these ideas and everything that um, you all are thinking about. You need the more, more people you read, to the write more like I, that. <laughs> I I well, no, you. it's just, it's just, it's so, yeah. I mean, you know, he just saw that yeah. happening mm -hmm. right in front of his eyes. So um, I, the more you read, I'm like, maybe Thomas Cole would like this title too. I think Thomas you know, Cole would he, he wouldn't know what a disco was. Well, yeah, yeah, well, I mean, and then <laughs> no more the deer shall haunt these bosky glens, nor the pert squirrel chatter near this store a few short years. Um, it's really powerful and um, prescient. But, well, Mark, do you want to do a quick um, sneak peek at some of the things in the studio before we welcome Betsy Jacks back and do a little Q&A with... Um, some of our audience members? Sure, yeah, okay. the PowerPoint. Yeah. I'm gonna try to share my screen again. If I can, I can, I can do it. You can do it, Kate. I know you All can. right, thank you. We have faith. <laughs> um, I'm gonna do slideshow. Let's see. Uh, all right, is that? And that's see? from an early studio visit. That was like a few years ago, that first one. This is, yeah, I feel like this is in like 2018 or 19. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a few years ago. That might have, was that around the first time that we all, like I remember a group from Mass Mocha came out and we went to the coal site and went to Mark's studio. I feel like that might have been from that, that meeting when we all first started coming together to talk about what this collaboration meant. I think so, yeah. Yeah. And the work has just, it's just been so extraordinary to watch as your work has uh, developed and you've been progressing. But here are some studio views, I guess from a couple of, you know, over across the year or so. And this was the piece that Mark, I was referencing earlier mm -hmm. in that piece where I was talking about the tender, it's, it's, I mean, I love all of the work in the show, but Mark knows that I have like a very soft spot for this piece because <laughs> it's so, there's something so raw and simple about it and, and that, um, that sense of are they are they fighting or embracing? I think is just so perfect for this whole project. Right or drunk? That was the or other drunk, thing. yeah. <laughs> the club, the club, <laughs> holding bar, each other know. up, <laughs> or or dancing, or dancing yeah. or drunk was part of it too for me. You know, <clears throat> here's this model. Yeah, that gives people a little bit of a sense of the mass mocha space. So it's a it's a huge gallery with, um, oh God, Mark, you'll probably remember better than me right now. Ugh. What are the site, height of I the know ceiling? It. I know it all too well. 22 foot ceiling. <laughs> and I think it's 40, this gallery is 41 feet wide and 125 feet long. And then the back gallery, I, I can't remember the. Yeah. And what's also 
I think exciting is one of the things we're doing within the space is we're building in a an area for um, Mark to collaborate with um, somebody who he's worked with before, Jack Ferber, um, who is an incredible uh, choreographer, writer, dancer, uh, teaches at Bard and has been teaching a class called is Global Warming Camp about all of these very same ideas. So there'll be uh, a time for Jack to develop performance that will happen within um, the exhibition next summer. Yeah. Yeah, it's really exciting. Jack's an incredible uh, performer and artist. And that's, the yeah. Back view of the Pieta there. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, these are all, you know, a lot of these are works in progress, just studio shots, but. Can you talk a little bit about the material um, that you use and, and the, the found material and, and stuff like that? So people have a little bit of a sense of what they're looking at. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I was a commercial sculptor for a long time and, and I can sculpt very realistically, but I've been using a lot of um, found and it's sort of, it has to do with, there's a lot of like coffee tables and furniture, there's things and, and cast off light fixtures that I found in places and I'm not, I'm not really like upcycling, but there is this kind of definitely residue in the, in the, the, work but then I also work a lot with plaster bandage and plaster and different kinds of um like these kind of water-based plaster based sort of resins and things and um there's a lot of branches there's a lot of uh taxidermy forms so it's it's a it's kind of an odd combination of things but um plaster bandage is a big part of it um for this show But sort of, I think of it as like, I've been like from early on in the concept, the show was sort of in my mind, like a combination of like memorial cemetery, diorama, like Cabela's store, um, like sort of one part, you know, Natural History Museum diorama, one part memorial cemetery, one part, uh, Busby, Berkeley, Ziegfeld Follies, one part disco. That's kind of, that's kind of my been my strategy of how to make the works come together. And I think what's also really nice is that you've been just developing the work for the show, which will take place in two parts. But you're not saying like this. I'm making this only for the Cole House. I'm making this only for Mass Mocha. You've just sort of been making the work, and of course, there's. Uh, issues of scale at hand. The Cole House is a, a domestic interior. So of course, some of the smaller works, but I think what will result from that is it's not going to feel like these two, you know, one big installation and then a satellite show. They're really going to be speaking to each other because they're all coming from this same sort of, you know, making uh, all up against each other. So I think that's, it's a really nice way um, to make the shows feel really connected. Well, and I thought they were going to have to be really separate. And then Kate just kept sort of like driving home that Thomas Cole, that these themes that I, it, to the level I wasn't really realizing was such a similar thing. I've, I've been drawn to Cole's work before. And, you know, one of his first paintings is um, uh, um, what is it? Lake uh, Deer with Dead Trees? Is oh, Lake with Dead Trees, yeah. yeah. It's Lake with Dead Trees, and it's like a lake, it's North South Lake, and then it has dead trees and a deer in it. <laughs> and it's like, you know, and I'm actually trying to get a dead tree right from that site, exactly where he painted it. Um, mm -hmm. If we can get the Parks Department, it's there's one that's slated to come down that I think is an old cedar, huge cedar tree. So hopefully, fingers crossed. If anybody knows anybody at North South Lake or the Parks Department, um, help us out. I want to get some stumps for bases for the show. But yeah, I've been thinking um, at one point I thought it had to be really different and it was confusing. And then I just started thinking about it as one show. And, and I think it makes a lot of sense. Should we? Yeah, I think. Timing we... wise, I'm not sure. 
Why don't we um, welcome Betsy Jacks back and we can open it up to some questions to our audience, if that um, sounds good to everybody. And I'm gonna stop the screen share. And welcome back, Betsy Jacks. Hi, Betsy. Hi. Oh my gosh, I can't wait for this show. <laughs> this is so amazing. It's so complex and so many layers and it's so relevant. So um, thank you all. And so I'll remind folks that you can ask a question by um, clicking on the Q&A icon and type in your question. So I'll start off with um, my question, I can choose, which is, I was wondering if you could just show us your studio behind you. It looks so intriguing. Like, could you just walk around <laughs> it and give oh, us a sure. little tour? Yeah, okay, let me, I guess I can just, I'm just gonna walk with the, with the camera. I won't be able to see the camera. So if it gets, um, and I'll try not to trip. So if it gets a little crazy, you just let me know or if there's something I should stop at. But um, I should say, I'm so fortunate to have this studio, um, which is in Catskill um, at Foreland Catskill, which is, um, it's this, I swear this is not a paid plug. I just love where I am, Portland Catskill is this amazing complex. I think it's 85,000 square feet of three different buildings um, here, right in the village of Catskill in the creek. Um, the founder, Stemos, is amazing. And she dreamed all this up. And so there's event space, the exhibition space, art studios. It's just this incredible creative campus that I feel so fortunate to be a part of and Catskill in general has just been such a generative place as an artist for me as a place where you can how do I always say it's a place where I get to think about art instead of the art market <laughs> escaping from New York so can you guys see everything yeah yeah, yeah looks um, amazing. and Mark this okay. isn't this wasn't your only space so making this these two shows that's the, this is that model that Denise was talking about. This is a quarter inch to one foot model of the space. So I like to make these for each show. Um, I'm sorry, Denise, what were you saying? Oh, I was just gonna say, um, I think it's important for our attendees to understand that um, this is what happens when you work at Mass Mocha and then also have a companion show at the Cole site is that no studio is big enough. So you've actually been <laughs> working across three studios in Catskill to yeah. make this work. Yes, yeah, I have, a, I, have a, I have a studio at Main Street that's about 400 square feet that I was gonna try and make a lot of the work in and then quickly realized it wasn't enough room in Bridge Street Theater, um, which is this amazing uh, uh, community. Basically, they work with the high school, but they also do these incredible productions and bring things from the city. John um, and Steve and John Soule and Stephen Patterson who are incredibly generous. And I've used their garage space many times to store things and everything. They're such a nice, uh, wonderful part of our artistic community here. And um, so I've been using the prop storage and, and, and costume storage garage space at Bridge Street because they have 20, I think it's 22 foot ceilings there because I needed ceiling height and space and they were, so generous and I traded, I paid for a little while, paid rent for a while and then I traded to do design a set there, which was amazing for long days journey home. And it was, I don't know, it's just been an incredible experience, but there's no heat there. And, <laughs> and <laughs> it's incredibly hot in the summer and incredibly cold in the winter. So when COVID hit, I thought I was gonna be able to do it between the two, between my studio and there and start maybe bringing a few pieces to Mass Mocha or make some stuff in residency at Mass Mocha because you guys offer that. Um, and then when the winter was coming, I was like, there's no way I can do it without heat. And then um, I, my partner, Joe, ran into Steph and she said, well, I got space because he said she asked how I was doing with the show. And so I've been here for a little over a year, which is just incredible. And so, yeah, I have three spaces all within short walking distance of each other and um, which is very helpful because I'm constantly like, where is my this? Like, like where where is the screw guns okay you know so anyway I also love how being at Bridge Street meant you could like 
go into the prop room and be like, okay, I'm going to use this coffee table temporarily yes. as a base. Yeah, and I then know. you'd, uh, and then my team from Mass Mocha came and you were like, can you make, remake these, <laughs> these props that I've borrowed in the interim? Yeah. So it's, it's been so interesting to see the work develop in Catskill and in our workshop here and, and how all of that will come together. Well, and also like there's um, in one of the pieces that Jack Ferber, the performer who's going to be doing this, our show Sham that we did in collaboration, the set pieces we made there were these modular set pieces and I donated them to, to Bridge Street and say they use them all the time. I'm using one piece actually in this show and it's just kind of just again like a full circle thing that's been so great. I have a couple other questions lined up to go. So okay, great. Um, one person asks, Mark, what was it like working on your show during the pandemic? A period of loss, like the loss of climate change. Well, um, I mean, it was interesting working on this show during the pandemic because you know, the show being about sort of climate change and AIDS, like they're, they're both things that were being ignored and not dealt with, you know what I mean? And then COVID came along and then we had a president who literally said it didn't exist either. <laughs> and so, you know, it was this incredible thing for, you know, the Reagans would not mention AIDS and sort of would not deal with it and, and would not, put any funding to it. So it was sort of an incredible moment to see, watch the whole, everyone have to deal with what it's like to have a government that wants to ignore a disease. But at the same time, they threw billions of dollars at it to get a vaccine. So that's a big difference. Um, but during the pandemic, it was really hard because I just could not, between the election and everything that was going on and COVID, like I couldn't even think straight. And my refuge was, um, being in nature. And it's hard to think about now, even that we would, you know, you, if you see someone, you would cross the street, you know, you couldn't be near anybody. And so I did find places to go in the woods and, and took a hike every day and, and got lots of long johns and new stuff, you know, so to make sure I could be hiking all winter and be in it. So my solace was really, luckily, this was a wonderful place to ride out a pandemic. And I felt so fortunate. And, um, just spent a lot of time in the woods, but fortunately it kept getting pushed back because I could not work. And it was really hard because I work, you know, in my own studio, I don't interact with other people. And it was sort of felt like the perfect moment as an artist, you know, everything shut down. It's what people think of, but I, I'm not a, like a studio artist like that. Like I'm in the studio a lot, but I'm out of the studio a lot and it's a real exchange for me. And so it was very, very difficult to work and I was totally I was I had um COVID I was really foggy brain for a long time from it too and it was in sick for a long time and so it was hard and I was beating myself up for not working um and I just was kind of paralyzed and so luckily it kept getting pushed back so I would have enough time you, you didn't make here because of COVID no, basically this would have all opened a year ago um, yeah yeah it was like first it got pushed back six months and that but then, you know, also, yeah, it felt um, kind of a interesting time to be doing a show about, like, really clearly about death and memorial at a time, you know, um, when that was really on people's minds. So. Well, I'll get to our next one then. Um, we have quite a few lined up here. Um, one person asked, which I noticed too, um, it looks like you have a portrait of an actor named Leonard Frey from Boys in the Band in one piece of your sculpture. Um, is that correct? Is that random? Does it have to do with bringing in a gay component into the mix? Any meaning you could expand on? Yes, that is Harold. I love that someone can pick that out. Um, I don't know if there's like, I don't think there's a really specific thing about having Harold in there, but yes, it is. That is from the first uh, movie version of The Boys in the Band, which as some people might know is, was the first, is considered the first big Hollywood film about gay people and was like very controversial at the time. It was a very successful play. But um, 
it's it is kind of it's very much a play format and um i wanted to bring that in, in in the way of sort of like holding this this space for like gay male culture in a certain way that is that i find um is very specific about what i was talking about and i saw that in high school it was a huge effect to me but also like i said there's a sense of theatricality to this work like there's a theatrical distance that i think um like queer people gay people gay men um, have employed historically that i'm using here and um so yeah i mean there's i definitely like i said there's a busby berkeley zigfield Polys. there's there's also like a sort of hollywood component to it i feel like sort of the way hollywood operates the diorama is this kind of idealized version of of life is also part of it and um and I just, it just worked really well there. I've had that still, film still for a really long time. And I put it in that frame and I put it there. I work really intuitively. So I don't have like a specific reason. I may, I make work that way. And then a lot of times, like a year or two later, I'm like, oh, that's what was going on there. <laughs> you know what I mean? So maybe you can check back in about the specific meaning later. But um, I love that you caught whoever caught it. I love whoever caught that very specific um, image. Anonymous comment, so I can't tell you who, um, uh -huh. because I don't know. Um, another one have uh, asked, I have a sense that children seeing your show will be deeply moved. Have you worked with young people? Um, I haven't that much. I mean, a couple of times when I've had other museum shows, I've had, um, you know, worked with education departments and with children, which I find really exciting. Um, I mean, you know, gratifying and, and great, but I haven't, I haven't worked with children very much. Yeah, no, I concur with that. My children are leading the way in our household with climate change awareness. And um, I think they're really going to respond well to your show. Well, I um, think there's something children have this special connection to animals. And actually, Timothy Morton, who's one of my favorite thinkers on climate change, talks about too, like how children have in in children's worlds animals are like so present and there's so much a part of their worlds and they're everywhere and then when we go into adulthood we don't sort of it's we have a very different relationship to animals like you know so many kids books and and films they're all sort of uh you know stories that involve animals and, and sort of in these in in different ways and i i think uh, you know not to avoid this question but i think i've employed that in a way like i feel like the animals in my show are often surrogates for people too yeah it reminds me of um john berger and his essay why I look at animals talks about animals as promises and messengers um, and I yeah. That. yeah, I love that essay. And I also, deers have also held this um, special place. My, my dad was, a, you know, a deer hunter when I was younger and I, and they've always just held this uh, really specific place of a kind of innocence to me, like this kind of the way they're so big and present, but also just such a I don't know. There's something they always, in my mind, been a symbol for for kind of innocence that I can't really find a better symbol for in my work. This person asks, "When did you start making your sculptures and installations covered in the color white, which seems to be a significant element in your work? Perhaps alluding directly to melting ice from environmental viewpoint and these objects that are frozen in time." that that well you got it that that is that i started doing it excuse me um about like uh probably about 2013 2014 um and using this this straight shape um and i think all of my work is has always been sort of about a longing and a desire and sort of things that are sort of sites of something that maybe was there before which just fits right in with memorial so 
Yeah, I think that was the whole, and I, I spent, a, I spend a lot of time in graveyards. I love graveyards, but I also um, really started spending a lot of time in them in the pandemic, a lot more time in the rural cemeteries in Troy and Albany and Hudson and in Catskill. But it's actually, the rural cemetery was a, a part of this story too. Like the first rural cemetery was in Boston, 1831, I believe. Um, in Cambridge, and I loved that cemetery when I lived there. And um, rural cemeteries were actually the precursors to parks. To to, and um, like one of the original pitches for for um, Central Park in New York was a rural cemetery without graves, literally, because the rural cemeteries came first, and they were commercial ventures, and. Um, and Thomas Cole, actually, there's the Catskill Rural Cemetery with an incredible view, which most rural cemeteries have. Thomas Cole is actually buried in the rural cemetery here. But um, yeah, there's definitely, I forgot that, you know, that is very clearly here. I think of these, a lot of these works, I think of sort of like grave markers and sort of uh, my sort of take on um, like I almost feel like any of these could work that way or any piece could work as a memorial in itself. I mean, I'm really conceiving the show kind of as an installation and sort of objects together. Like I want it to sort of feel, and I feel like sort of a graveyard has that kind of feel where the whole thing is a graveyard, but then you get these very individual things that are kind of repetitive and you walk around and you see them, but it holds together as one whole thing too. But yeah, that's when I started using I, the show. It, I did at Basilica. Almost everything was painted white, um, and it was partly just as a strategy to not have to change the color of the plaster that I was using, um, because it had such a beautiful natural color. So if I used the bases for it in um, in white, it just it would formally work better. Well, people are often surprised and um, and delighted to learn that Thomas Cole's grave is only just a few blocks from the Thomas Cole house, so you can walk there. Maybe we should all do a, a walk down the street and visit during the course of this exhibition. I would love to. Yeah, we were talking about that. We could do an artist. Once everything is up, let's all meet again and... Uh and look at the exhibitions at Massimoca and the Cole site. And maybe this summer we can do a walk with you, Mark, to the grave site and down to yeah. Castle Creek. I think that and would be And I'd like so to do it. Uh, yeah, I'd like to have people come to my house too and see, I'll have Beth Joe. I don't think it's okay. Um, yes. uh, uh, over. He's, pretty, he's pretty friendly. Um, no, uh, I think we should bring a, a group there too, because you guys have done a kayaking group right there, like a tour right there right yes we've had a, a group paddle on the creek um so in great. conjunction with various shows paintings That's of so the creek cool. etc yeah well i think we're just about out of time um to after three so i would like to thank everybody for joining us and thank you guys i cannot wait until this exhibition so it's opening march 12th at Mass Mocha, and then it will open in July at the Thomas Cole site. So join us then. Um, our next Sunday salon will be in a month. So you can go to thomascole.org to find those and all the programs at Mass Mocha at massmocha.org. All right, everyone have Thank a good you. afternoon. Thanks everybody for Thank coming. Thank you everyone. Great to see you all. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.